Hello everybody and good evening. Welcome to this BAFTA Games live stream live from Creative Assembly. I'm James Green and I'm going to spend the next hour discussing asymmetric design. Uh, we've joined up with BAFTA Games for this live stream as part of their BAFTA Crew Games program, a network for those currently working in the games industry to have access to BAFTA award-winning talent and nominees. Creative Assembly has been nominated for over 15 BAFTA awards during our 30 years of developing games, and we often support BAFTA in their work to inspire more young people into game dev careers. So today I'm going to be talking about the sweet spot of asymmetric design. And I'm going to start by asking a question. What is the relationship between asymmetry and quality? Um, I'm going to attempt to answer this question, uh, but I'm also going to explain why I got to the to where I've got to in my career as a, as a designer in, in answering this question. And I'm also going to give you some tools to determine how to answer this question in your own game. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a game designer with over 13 years experience. Um, I've worked on Empire, Total War, Napoleon, Total War, Shogun 2, Total War. I also worked on Alien Isolation, Halo Wars 2, and I'm currently the lead gameplay designer on an unannounced Total War project. So uh, across all these games throughout my career, I've been very fortunate to be able to work on a lot of games where asymmetric design was very important. Uh, and that's good for me because it's something um, I'm very passionate about and, and have been very passionate about since I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. Uh, my fascination with asymmetric design started with uh, early uh, real-time strategy games like the Command and Conquer games. And from the age of sort of 10 or 11, I was a, a map maker and a modder in these games. And this really is where I developed my, my passion for asymmetry in games. And so I'm delighted to share some of my theories and ideas with you guys today. Uh, so coming back to that question I asked right at the beginning, um, I'm going to start by defining some terms. So firstly, uh, what is an asymmetrical game? Well, let's start by talking about what a symmetrical game is. The classic example of a symmetrical game is chess. So in chess, both players have the same pieces, the same information and the same goals. Um, and the fact that that's player centric, uh, the, the definition I've come up with there is, is very important. And I'll come back to why that is later. Um, asymmetrical games, on the other hand, uh, are where both players are different in, in some way. So the players might have different starting positions. They might have different objectives. Uh, there might be some self-sorting asymmetry. For example, if we're playing a co-op game, uh, like a puzzle platformer or something you're good at puzzles I'm good at platforming you can see how we would sort just amongst ourselves into different categories of asymmetry um, there's also randomness so asymmetry can come from the luck of the draw uh, and there's asymmetry of information whereby I know something you don't um, but I'm actually going to talk about one very specific area of asymmetry and that's player asymmetry so this is the idea that the player makes a meaningful choice to take on different gameplay properties. This That maybe sounds a bit wordy, um, but actually it's much easier to think of in terms of examples. So uh, we could talk about a class-based shooter like Overwatch. We could talk about a, a real-time strategy game like Starcraft, a fighting game like Street Fighter, uh, a deck building game like, like Magic. Uh, and something all these games have in common is that the player is making a choice to take on different properties. So um, if they play as Chun-Li in Street Fighter, uh, the player is aware that they're taking on a character that has different strengths and weaknesses to, say, someone like Ryu. Um, and this trade-off is, is very important to this concept of player asymmetry. So why this particular type of player asymmetry? Uh, well, it's because when people tend to talk about asymmetry and the thing that makes them excited about asymmetry is actually this very concept. So it is character classes in a shooter. It is factions in a in a strategy game or a grand strategy game um, or heroes in a, in a MOBA. It's the kind of back of the box feature uh, that really matters to players. It really resonates with them. Um, it's also a lot of work to make a game where you're kind of committed to this design pillar. Um, so you want to get it right. And the risk there is is quite big. And so that's why this is so important, um, which leads us on to uh, quite an important question, which is what is the right amount of asymmetry in your game? And this is a question that isn't usually asked, but I think it should be. Um, and the reason this question isn't asked very much is because for a long time, games have 
kind of been made in a certain way, which is you've decided your game needs to be asymmetric or it's decided for you. Um, your project, your game lasts, let's say two or three years and you do as much asymmetry as you can with the, the resources you have available. And you use play tests, you use your experience, you use iteration uh, to kind of determine where you're right and where you're wrong. So you're basically doing as much asymmetry as you can in the time you have. And the guardrail is that, well, you don't have all the time and resources in the world, so you're naturally limited in the amount of asymmetry you can do. Um, and the problem with this approach, um, and this approach works, by the way, some of the, the greatest uh, asymmetrical games ever made have been made using this approach. So it works, but we exist now in a, in a changing world in terms of game development. The old guardrails I just talked about don't always hold up. We're talking about games now that are being played for five or ten years or maybe even more. We also have indie games, early access, patches, uh, uh, games as a service, season passes. There's lots of ways to consume and make games that aren't like the old models. And when that's the case, we need to adapt our design process so that we're not just cramming in as much asymmetry as we can in a limited amount of time. We have a more full understanding of, of why we're doing what we're doing. And, and that's what this talk is about. Um, so um, I, I already uh, uh, talked about asymmetry. So let's talk about quality. So quality is kind of whatever you want it to be. So how cool your game is, how good your game is, how fun it is. You might even use metrics like um, the Metacritic or how many players you have. It's however you want to define quality, how good your your game uh, uh, should be. And obviously you as the developer are working every day to make quality the best it can be. Um, so given that, what is the right amount of asymmetry to create the, to create the best game possible? Um, well, the answer is you need to find the sweet spot. And obviously that's very much what this talk is about. Okay, so let's propose a graph. This is a graph of quality in a game versus asymmetry. Obviously, quality goes from a poor quality game, one that probably people don't want to play, to a very good game. And likewise, asymmetry goes from uh, a completely symmetrical game to a completely asymmetrical game. So to be clear, this is not a, a real graph. You'll never have real data to go in this graph. This is a thought experiment. And by modeling different outcomes in our mind, uh, sort of experimentally, um, we can we can game out what our game looks like under under different circumstances. So let's let's start with something simple, right? So in this in this graph, uh, as asymmetry increases, quality is going down. So the more asymmetric you make your game, the worse it gets. So obviously we don't want to be making this type of game. In fact, this game probably wants to be a symmetrical game, and something in our development has has gone wrong. Um, Similarly is this graph. So as asymmetry increases, quality stays about the same. So this isn't a disaster, but if we're putting a lot of resources and effort into the asymmetry in our game, what we don't want is for the quality of the game to be completely unchanged. Ideally, we want the asymmetry to make the game better, not keep it the same. Um, so this is this is somewhat theoretical, although um, I, I, I you know I, I don't know about the development of Rocket League, but you could easily see how a game like Rocket League might have come to, to this same conclusion. They all the vehicles in Rocket League essentially handle in the same way. There's some very minor differences. They could have taken the approach like Mario Kart or something like that, where all the vehicles behave quite differently. Um, but I suspect they they came to the conclusion rightly, I think that. In their case, asymmetry would not enhance the quality of their game, and that's a perfectly uh, fine choice. Okay, so let's look at some. Let's look at another example. Um, in this particular case, as asymmetry in our game increases, so does quality, and there's a an obvious linear relationship there. So this is great, right? This is exactly what you want. Asymmetry goes up, quality goes up. The game gets better. Fine. This is this is desirable. Except, if you think about it, this isn't very likely, is it? Um, the, the situation where you keep adding systems, you keep adding characters, weapons, mechanics, and the game just linearly gets better and better doesn't seem very likely. At some point, surely your game is going to get unwieldy and overcomplicated. Okay, so this maybe looks like a more realistic example. So initially, as asymmetry in our game increases, so does quality. But there's diminishing returns. So 
at some point this will start to level off and as we increase asymmetry quality stays basically the same it's it's diminishing returns right we're putting resources and time into adding systems or whatever to our game and it's not really doing anything for our game so this is fairly defensible right i, I could imagine the game dev cycle where this is happening um but i actually have a slightly different theory uh, and my theory is actually this which is that um yes initially as asymmetry increases so does quality and you're going to get that diminishing returns kind of curve but then what's going to happen is at some point you're going to pass the sweet spot and as you add more systems or as you add more asymmetry to your game quality is actually going to suffer um, maybe newer systems are going to push out older ones or you're going to start to push the game in a direction that's not actually that good um, this really is my thesis of, of asymmetry in games and i'm kind of going to spend uh, going to spend a lot of the rest of the talk kind of justifying why i think this is the case okay so let's zoom in a little bit so we're aiming for this dotted line right where that's where the sweet spot is now the problem is that when you're making a game you don't actually know what the best version of your game looks like until you get there or sometimes afterwards it's not something you can plan right at the beginning of your project and say yes when the game is perfect that's what it's going to look like it's hard to get to this place um, and sometimes you're going to undershoot you're going to do maybe too little asymmetry maybe a bit less than you need sometimes you're going to overshoot and you're going to do a little too much now is there a difference there is there a difference between too little and too much both are missing right both are slightly missing the sweet spot is there actually any difference and i think there is um, so i'm just going to break down a list of things properties risks things in your game and i'm going to sort them into whether they're whether they occur with too little or, or too much asymmetry so balance uh, it's pretty uncontroversial to say that a more asymmetrical game is harder to balance right that's just something that's uni universally true um equally uh with a, a more asymmetric game you need to have more built-in checks so an example might be you've got a real-time strategy game with several factions some of the factions have air units some of them don't but even though some of the factions have them and some of them don't everyone needs an anti-air unit so you need more built-in checks more built-in redundancies in your system and that's just a consequence of, of more asymmetry um, marketing so again um, if your game is is selling itself based on its asymmetry uh, it's going to look the more asymmetry you do the better it's going to look in in traditional marketing right because people are going to see all the asymmetry all oh, that game looks exciting um, likewise development resources um, again it's pretty clear that the more asymmetry you do the more time money whatever that's going to cost and and that's going to take away from other areas of the game um, complexity is another one if you push push asymmetry too far the complexity of your game is going to creep up and in most cases complexity is undesirable on its own um, richness kind of similar to, to marketing um, the more kind of asymmetry you have the more rich and interesting your game is now um, this is not straightforwardly a win for having too much asymmetry in your game because these days very few games as i established earlier are finished they're not done when they're done you have a roadmap you have patches you have post-release content and the richness is something you can make up for later in your game's roadmap so even too little asymmetry here can be fixed later as long as your game sort of takes off um, mitigating risk so you know risk in development is a big problem right um, this can damage teams this can damage studios this can damage games you, you need to manage risks right and doing too little asymmetry is mitigating risks to your project and then finally um your roadmap so again this kind of whole post-release idea um can be hindered if you have too much asymmetry in your game for example you might use all your really good ideas for your initial launch and then not have conserved enough of your design space later so as we look down these these lists I, i've i've been making and obviously this is not everything there's there's a lot more to games and game development than this but i hope you can see a pattern is starting to emerge here that too little is looking a little bit better 
often too much. Uh, and I have a theory, and I encourage all you game devs out there to do this exercise for your own game. I would encourage you to game out what too little asymmetry and too much asymmetry looks like in your game. And I think you'll find the same pattern. I think you'll find that uh, undershooting in nearly in most cases is better than overshooting and that's an important concept and it brings us to the the first lesson of, of, of my talk today which is um, you want to aim for the sweet spot obviously the sweet spot is where you're trying to get to um, but if you miss and you probably will because it's hard it's better to undershoot than it is to overshoot okay so I've talked in in somewhat general terms so far uh, and for the second half of my talk, um, I'm going to drill into four uh, slightly more specific examples. Uh, some of them are from games I've, I've worked on, some of them are from games I haven't worked on, but were important to me in some way. And with each one of these, hopefully I'm going to pull out a lesson and, and some tools uh, for you to use to kind of solve the same problems in your own games. Um, so I'm going to start with, with Total War. So the asymmetry in Total War obviously comes from the different factions, uh, and this is very much the, the fantasy of, of Total War, right? That the Orcs feel really different to the Skaven, or the Scots in Medieval 2 feel really different to the Holy Roman Empire. And this is a lot of the reason why people play Total War games, it's for this reason. So we've made uh, a lot of Total War games, uh, this isn't even all of them <laughs> I've, I've listed on this slide. Um, but this is not a solved problem in Total War. Um, actually, the amount of asymmetry in Total War varies quite a lot game to game. In some cases, it's almost a new problem from game to game. Um, but we know our players prefer the asymmetry between factions in Total War to be very high. Uh, but we don't always take this approach. So why is that? If, if we know our players prefer the, the greater asymmetry of, of Warhammer or of Rome 2, why isn't that always our approach? Why would we do things we know our players don't like as much? And why would we change this every time? Isn't that, doesn't that make it harder to make Total War games? The answer, of course, is, is, is yes. Um, but uh, despite the, the factional asymmetry in Total War being very important, it's not the only thing that's important. One of the reasons Total War has lasted as, as long as it has, nearly 20 years, is because we constantly keep jumping to different parts of history, to, to different conflicts, to, to different geographical areas, to different time periods. The scope changes a lot. Sometimes our campaign maps in Total War are almost the entire planet, or sometimes they're zoomed in right in on one individual country. And when we do that, we need to be authentic to the time period and the place we're visiting. For example, when we made Shogun 2, uh, it had beautiful, authentic Japanese style art and it really captured the feeling of, of medieval Japan. We could have made Shogun 2 like a Warhammer type game. We could have made the unit rosters across all the factions extremely different. We could have maybe even shared none of the units across them. The problem is that just wouldn't have been historically true. Uh, and hence it would violate that other really important pillar in Total War, which is the historical authenticity. Now, obviously, we know the asymmetry in Total War is important. It's one of the reasons people can play Total War for thousands of hours. Um, but when we can't do it through uh, faction asymmetry and unit rosters, we do it through other ways. So. In Shogun 2, uh, we really pushed the sort of faction traits so that the factions, even though they had basically the same units, felt really different to each other anyway. Um, we also explored things like skill trees for generals for the first time in Shogun 2, and that's that's gone on to become a, a staple of the series. Likewise, in 3K, uh, or Th Three Kingdoms, I should say, the, um, the focus was on the characters, so the asymmetry came a lot from their abilities, their mechanics, and their relationship with the other characters in the game. So when we can't push asymmetry through factions, we do find other ways to do it. So the lesson here is uh, the highest level of asymmetry in terms of pure gameplay is never your only goal. You do need to have a holistic view of your game. Okay, so next let's talk about MOBAs. So this is the uh, the graph I, I proposed earlier of um, uh, of the, the sweet spot of, of asymmetry. Now on the face of it, 
MOBAs would appear to completely contradict what I'm saying. Some MOBAs have been going for a decade and have dozens, possibly even uh, in some cases, you know, t tens and, and or hundreds of, of characters. And, you know, they're showing no signs of stopping. So if my graph and, and my theory about asymmetry is true, well, how can, how can MOBAs possibly exist? And how can they keep going? Well, so the first reason uh, uh, is actually, uh, pardon me, is actually quite simple. So MOBAs are very asymmetrical, but their great trick is that they appear more asymmetrical than they actually are. And they do this through the roles. So different MOBAs have different numbers of roles. Some have sort of five or six, some have 10. Um, it just depends on how the, how the designers and the developers categorize the game. Um, but what's always true is that uh, a new character or a new hero, a new champion, never adds a role, they're always just a take on an existing role. And the role of a character plays a much more important part in how they play uh, than their actual abilities. And as I said, MOBAs rarely, if, if ever, will add a new role. Um, let's just game out what would happen if they did. If they did add a, a new role, you know, let's say a couple of times a year or every new character even had a new role, what would happen? Well, very quickly the game would warp around the new roles and very quickly it would be a different game. The old, the new roles would push out the old ones and suddenly it's not the MOBA um, you've been playing, which would be very undesirable. Secondly, uh, MOBAs have a fairly tight design template. Uh, most MOBAs stick to the format of the original mod back in the day, which is that each character has three normal abilities and an ultimate ability. So this is quite restrictive and it creates quite tight rules, but it maximizes the asymmetry visible in MOBAs. Uh, firstly, it makes it very easy to compare heroes uh, so players can really appreciate the asymmetry. There's no point having tons of asymmetry in your game if only you, the designer, can appreciate it and it's largely invisible to the player. Equally, it uh, enforces discipline on you as the developer. You can imagine if the MOBA template was set at eight abilities per hero, uh, that would have stuck and each hero would have been probably twice as complicated as it, as it needed to be. Um, and also, uh, uh, that would have stuck and you get through all your cool ideas for heroes in in half the time because you need to do twice as many abilities finally um although mobas change a lot they're always adding uh, uh champions or heroes or, or characters or whatever you want to call them um there's a lot in mobas that never changes so team size doesn't change most mobas are a five versus five and, and always will be um Equally, if you if you play something like uh, something like a, a draft mode, which is the sort of standard mode for competitive play, the number of picks and bans doesn't really change. What this tends to mean is that within each role, and remember the role is more important than the character, there's you know a handful of characters, uh, a top viable characters in each role, and that's and there's always going to be that same handful, even though they may change over time and the meta may shift. There's always going to be that that fixed number, whether there's 100 champions in your MOBA or 1,000 champions in your MOBA. And this helps to keep things quite fixed. Um, there's also other things in MOBAs that are quite fixed. Uh, lots of MOBAs have a single map, which rarely ever changes, or have a set of items that don't change very much. Um, equally, in a MOBA, you just play as one character, and over time, that, that character is largely unchanging. So if you know how to play Anti-Mage now, in five years, you're largely still going to know how to play Anti-Mage. Contrast that with, say, a real-time strategy game where the developers added new units to your faction every couple of months. That'd be quite a different prospect, because every couple of months you'd need to relearn your faction, and it would grow more complicated over time. So uh, the lesson here really from MOBAs is understanding what the anchors, the immovable parts of your game are. Understanding what isn't going to change about your asymmetric game is impor as, as important as understanding what will change. Okay, so Halo Wars 2. So Halo Wars 2 is uh, a, a fairly typical uh, real-time strategy game. It has two factions, which is uh, uh, somewhat low for an RTS. Most RTSs these days have you know, three, four factions. Um, and the asymmetry in 
uh, Halo Wars 2 largely came from the different leaders. So um, although there are only although there are only two factions, each faction had several leaders. You had to pick a leader, and each leader put a completely different inflection on how the faction worked. They had unique units, unique upgrades, unique heroes, unique powers. So when we were working on on Halo Wars 2, we thought a lot about how we wanted to change it up from Halo Wars 1. It was it was a sequel and we, we wanted to do some things differently. Uh, and where we ended up was um, we made the two factions in Halo Wars 2 more similar to the two factions in Halo Wars 1, but we made the set of leaders in Halo Wars 2 much more different than they were in Halo Wars 1. Uh, and I'm going to sort of talk about how and, and, and why we ended up uh, in that space because it's it's quite instructional and, and quite interesting. So um, we had a few things we wanted to do with with Halo Wars 2 when we started on the project. Um, in Halo Wars 1 only one of the factions, the the Covenant, the sort of bad guys, uh, had powerful hero units. The, the UNSC uh, had Spartan units which is what you'd expect from a, a Halo game and they were kind of cool uh, but they were a little bit throwaway and they, they didn't quite occupy that hero space we wanted to. So one of our goals in, in Halo Wars 2 was to uh, make it so both factions got really powerful hero units. Equally, in Halo Wars 1, only the UNSC faction got these sort of orbital uh, uh, drop-in leader powers. Um, and these would, these would be things like bombing runs, artillery, dropping units into the battlefield. Um, in the first game, the Covenant faction didn't get access to these. And in Halo Wars 2, we wanted to make it so both factions got access to these. Um, so both these changes reduced asymmetry in, or factional asymmetry in Halo Wars 2 versus Halo Wars 1. But they were both good changes. They were both changes players were really happy with because they kind of gave them more tools, more t more toys, more choice to play with. Um, equally, when we were doing, uh, when we came to do um, Halo Wars 2, we made a couple of other changes. So we standardized how the tech tree worked for, for both for both factions in Halo Wars 2. In, in Halo Wars 1, uh, they worked slightly differently for each faction. Um, although our issue was in Halo Wars 1, this was somewhat of a cosmetic change. The sort of deep strategic decisions you made about what, how you embarked uh, up the tech tree um, although they cosmetically looked and felt a bit different, actually the decisions you made were basically the same. Um, and we kind of didn't want that unnecessary complexity. Uh, equally, we had to make decisions about uh, what units to bring back from the first game uh, and what you and what new units we wanted to replace them with. It was a sequel, so we wanted to do you know a mixture of, of new and old. Uh, we made lots of other little decisions, uh, but these were kind of the main ones. Um, so the consequences of this were that uh, when we launched our beta, which had just two leaders in it, uh, one leader for one faction, one leader for the other one, um, to, to some of the players in the beta, um, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't totally clear uh, that we'd made the factions very different because you didn't have multiple leaders uh, to, to, to appreciate that difference. So by the time we uh, got to the initial launch, lineup uh, of six leaders that that difference became more clear and then by the time we'd done uh, the sort of post-release content and the expansion pack we made it was very uh, you know we got got up to 16 leaders i think it was very clear uh, the difference we'd, we'd made um but that journey to that point was was sort of interesting um so looking back on balance uh, i think possibly we should have uh, pushed the factional asymmetry a little bit in halo wars 2 although by and large, I do think we made the correct, justifiable decisions. Um, I just wanted to talk about possibly the ch some changes I actually might have, have made uh, if I had the chance to, to go back. And I can't cheat here. I can't add millions of units to the game or anything. This is just kind of taking the same kind of amount of work and, and putting a slightly different twist on it. Um, but to do that, I'm going to take a little step back first. And I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the, the granddaddy of asymmetry in... in uh, strategy games, which is the original StarCraft. So the original StarCraft uh, kind of set the template. It had three very highly asymmetric factions. And I wanted to just look at two of the most basic units uh, in two of those factions. So on the left, we have the, the Protoss Zealot. And on the right, we have the, the Zerg Zergling. Um, so these two units feel very, very different to play. Um, 
the zealot is a very tough fairly expensive uh, formidable unit it's comparatively slow uh, but it's it's absolutely formidable um zerglings meanwhile are like little insects you, you can build tons of them they kind of just swarm around the the map they can easily surround stuff in the open but they're not very good in in choke points um and what's really interesting about the, the gameplay properties here is that both these two units capture the theme of their factions very, very well. So the Protoss are a, a dying, dying race who are individually very formidable, whereas the Zerg is made up of just swarms of throwaway sort of cannon fodder type insectoid units. Now, the interesting thing about these, these two units is they're absolutely identical, right? They're both just simple melee units no specific no special properties no special abilities they're just absolutely standard units the only difference between them is cost hit points and attack damage and speed and that's it and yet they feel totally different this is this is asymmetry done really well this is strongly expressing superb asymmetry with very very simple units that are just changing the the minimum amount of stuff um so coming back to, to halo wars 2 uh, in Halo Wars 2, these are the, the two basic anti-vehicle specialists in the game. Uh, the Hunters for the uh, uh, for the Vanish, sorry, and the Cyclops for the UNSC. Uh, they're both infantry units. And likewise, um, for the, uh, for the uh, anti-air specialists on each faction, we've got the Banished Reaver on the left there and the UNSC Wolverine on the right, and they're both vehicles. So a piece of asymmetry or a piece of asymmetric design I think we should have explored is, is actually something the original Halo Wars did, uh, which is that the anti-air specialist for one of the factions, the Vampire, uh, was an air unit. And the anti-vehicle specialist for one of the other factions, the Cobra, was a ground unit. And because infantry vehicles and air type units all just fundamentally play pretty differently, um, this added a lot of asymmetry in the original Halo Wars uh, that we could have easily done in, in Halo Wars 2. Um, but it doesn't really add much complexity because um, there's still just one unit you need to learn, right? If you want to know how to beat air units, you, you're still just looking for the, the single anti-air specialist to build. But it adds noticeable asymmetry. Uh, and I think uh, we could have maybe made a few decisions like this that, that were small but very, very meaningful to the asymmetry um, without adding the complexity and still giving that strong base to do those super asymmetrical leaders that, that, that we did end up exploring. Um, and so the lesson here really is that um, a small amount of asymmetry done well can be very meaningful. Um, you don't need to create tons of units with different properties, special abilities, spells to create very meaningful differentiation as we, as we saw from the, the StarCraft example. Okay, so the, the last example I'm gonna look at is uh, from uh, Dawn of War. So uh, Dawn of War is a very classic uh, real-time strategy game. It's, it's a game that I played a lot b before I entered the, the games industry, and it's, it's absolutely superb, classic game. Um, it's made by our now sister studio, uh, uh, Relic uh, Entertainment. And it really formed, as well as being a great real-time strategy game, it really formed my views about um, asymmetric design and, and how it should work. So Dawn of War, in many ways, is uh, a classic RTS. It's got two resources. Uh, the blue resource is requisition. That's the sort of standard resource uh, used for, for most things. And then it's got the, the green resource power, which is used for sort of high tech units and, and upgrades and things like that. So fairly standard for, for a real time strategy game. Now, in one of the expansions, um, they added the Necron faction. And uh, the Necron faction came with a really bold piece of, of asymmetric design. So Necrons did not use the primary resource requisition at all. Instead, they had this uh, time-based system where the time it took to, to train your units would would scale based on a few factors like army size, how much of the the map you can you controlled, uh, how many how far down the tech tree you were, um, and this completely replaced the, the primary resource requisition. 
and then everything on the Necron faction was either free or cost the secondary resource power. So they didn't use the primary resource at all. It didn't even show up in their user interface. So this is a, an incredibly bold piece of, of asymmetric design. Players at the time were were fascinated. It was an amazing talking point, and and it is a genuinely uh, a strong piece of, of asymmetry. Um, uh, but I actually think the direction of this wa was wrong. And although I feel the goal of, of making Necrons feel fundamentally different is is correct, I actually don't agree with the, the way it was done and, and I would have done it differently. Um, and I was lucky enough to to do a, a version of this talk to the, the uh, designers, uh, Relic, our, our sister studio, and some of the designers that, that worked on the original Dawn of War are, are still there. And it was really interesting to talk to them about um, uh, their feelings about it and what they they'd learned from that project going forward and I'm, I'm going to share some of my thoughts and some of their thoughts with with you today um so so why don't i think this is the right direction so a few reasons firstly um the switch up from the requisition resource to the kind of time-based system um looked really differently and at first it it feels really different but the issue is that the the kind of long-term choices and strategic choices you make in games with this system are not actually very different to what all the other factions are, are, are making um which is kind of a problem if you're going to add so much complexity and, and so much of a learning curve um the second issue is is actually comes back to to what i said about mobas um because the necron units didn't cost requisition and, and only cost power or in some cases didn't cost any power at all they were completely free um it was very very difficult to compare them to the unit rosters of, of the other factions and this is a problem right as, as i said with mobas part of asymmetry is your players being able to appreciate the asymmetry and, and talk to other players about them and, and compare things and and this was was lost somewhat with the, the necrons uh, and then finally, and, and this was Relic's biggest takeaway from, from the Necrons, is that um, they'd lost parity of goals in the game. So um, map control ended up just being a lot less important for the Necron player. Um, it still mattered, it was still incentivized, um, but their time-based system made it so that not expanding across the map, which all the other factions had to do, uh, was less of a cost for them. It still it still hurt. You still did want map control, but it ended up not being that hard barrier that it that it was for other players. And th and this is why I I you know possibly would would do things slightly slightly differently. Um, and and this actually comes back to the idea of of understanding the resources in your in your game. And there's sort of three different types of resources, high level, mid level, low level, you can you can group them like that. Um, on the high level, we have your victory conditions, how you win the game. So in a strategy game, that's usually wiping out the other players' structures and sometimes their, their units. In a fighting game, it's reducing their health to zero and, and knocking them out. Um, the sort of mid-level is your minute-to-minute -minute resources. So in a strategy game, you need to go out and mine resources to, to build your army. In a fighting game, you have to worry about your combo meter, super meter, ultra meter, guard meter, whatever resources your fighting game uses, and they all use some level of resources. And then finally, on the on the low level, you have the, the sort of things people expect. So your different units feel different. They have different hit points, different abilities, different speeds, different damage, and so on. And then in a fighting game, all the fighters have, have different moves and possibly slightly different sort of hit points and movement speeds and things like that. And those are kind of the things people expect. So when we're talking about understanding the resources in our, in our game, um, in most games, the high level resources, the way you win, isn't going to be subject to asymmetry. That's going to stay the same for all players. You can make a game where uh, there are lots of different ways to win, but if you do that, that tends to be the focus of your game. So most asymmetrical games, the victory condition is, is fairly consistent. And then going to the, the, the low level, um, this is kind of all the, the stuff that's expected, right? People expect that your units are going to be different from one another. They expect that your fighters are going to be different from one another. You can vary these a lot, players are going to expect this and they're not going to be amazed because you gave Ryu different moves to Chun-Li. That's just what they expect. So on the middle level, you have these sort of fundamental minute-to-minute -minute resources. Um, 
like the, the combo meter or the ultra meter or uh, the resources uh, your game uses. So in strategy games, we we saw uh, through the example of the the necrons that, that that you know there are some issues there. It can be a, a risk. Likewise, uh, in a fighting game, you could make it so one character in the whole roster doesn't have a super meter and they have some other mechanic and all these things are fine but what you need to understand as you're as you're making your asymmetric game is that this is the most tempting and the most fruitful but also the most dangerous space to mess in when you're when you're looking for uh, for, for asymmetry to put into your game and the lesson really from this is that um uh, is that you need to understand the, the fundamental resources and tensions in your in your game. Um, you don't need to add lots of units and special abilities to, to create this kind of differentiation. Um, you know, splashy things are good, but they shouldn't feel too gimmicky. Um, okay, so I'm I'm kind of drawing to a to a close, uh, and I'm going to just finish by returning to that question uh, that I posed right at the beginning. What is the relationship between asymmetry and quality? Well, the answer, as I've given you, is to is to find your sweet spot. So hopefully I've given you um, some tools to, to work out what the sweet spot in your game is. Uh, and I've kind of given you an idea of how to game out whether um, or what your game looks like if you add or take away mechanics. Um, hopefully I've given you the tools to assess if, if you're doing asymmetry in, in the right way. Um, is there something simpler and bolder you can be doing instead or, or are you breaking your own rules which can be really exciting for asymmetry but can also be really dangerous so uh, best of luck with your asymmetrical games and uh, I look forward to, to playing with them um, thank you very much um, I think I've got maybe some time to to answer some questions from from chat uh, so I've got a few lined up with me that uh, someone's been saving as I've, I've been going through so I'm gonna just take a few minutes to, to answer some of those those questions that have come up. Uh, so the, the first question I've got is, uh, if a game is compromising quality through too much asymmetry, are there any methods to reduce the asymmetry? I'd say test clients exist, however, I don't feel they, they are used they're used in the most effective way as they mostly get used for bug fixing and previewing a new asymmetric feature rather than actually gauging the quality of the game as a result of new asymmetric features. Uh, so the, the first part of that question is, um, are there any methods to reduce asymmetry? Uh, so the, the best way of reducing asymmetry is to practice uh, subtractive design. So subtractive design is, is actually just, just what it says on the tin. It's just try taking mechanics away from your game um, and seeing if the game is, is stronger and more enjoyable without them and you'd be surprised at how often that is the case that you took away some complex system and actually the game was better and in some cases um, because it's easier to appreciate and understand the asymmetry in your game sometimes the game can feel more asymmetric partly because players understand it better, but also because they get more time to, to focus on some of the other systems and, and mechanics at, at work. Um, the next question. Um, with a property like Warhammer, where faction asymmetry is important, how do you tackle the design of basic infantry? Uh, how, do you, how do you ensure bleak swords, dwarf warriors, and empire swordsmen feel distinct while still fulfilling the same role? Um, so I, I not worked on the... Um, Warhammer series, um, although I did, uh, uh, in preparation for this talk, I, I did have uh, a few conversations with uh, their design team um, about their approach. And, and genuinely, I'd say if, if you like asymmetric design, I, I genuinely think the Warhammer designers are doing an incredible job. They're just producing some of the most interesting um, asymmetric mechanics out there right now, especially in, in strategy games. Um, I'll adapt the questions slightly to talk about, uh, I'll talk about Halo Wars 2 and, and kind of adapt the question to that. So it's the same idea, right? Um, in Halo Wars 2, we had plenty of basic units and um, it was important to um, make those basic units feel as different as possible without having to cram in lots of extra kind of mechanics and, and things like that. Um, the way we approached it on, on that game, um, is actually to, to keep it simple. Um, so uh, as I hopefully kind of explained with the, the StarCraft example, you can do a lot with just things like 
speed, damage, hit points, things like that. You can actually keep it really, really simple um, and do a lot in that space. Uh, and I actually think um, your your game tends to feel more asymmetric if you keep it as, as simple as possible rather than less asymmetric. Um, I mean, coming back to the, the MOBA example, um, I think if you gave every champion in a, in a MOBA 10 abilities rather than four, you might think that would make the game more asymmetric, but I actually don't think it does. I think you give each of those different abilities less space to, to, to breathe. Um, and also means you're just consuming kind of all your really interesting ideas where they're, they're not needed and where they're not appreciably adding much to the, the game. Um, so I, I, I know I didn't answer that directly for, for Warhammer, but hopefully I, I sort of explained some of the, the design principles. Um, when you're working on a game like Total War, presumably you have a vision of what you want the game to end up like, perhaps a guiding principle. How do you ensure you don't lose sight of that uh, as you add asymmetry through the stages of development? Um, so games tend to have pillars um, and, and the sort of fundaments of the, the design and kind of what you're, you're building the, the vision of the, the game on. Um, and I think to, to keep your guiding principles, um, you just need to have really good pillars and the team needs to, needs to buy into those pillars and you need to just constantly do the work to keep re-establishing those pillars and redefining them. I, I think on a, on a really big team, that's how you keep those guiding principles. But I think even on a, on a small team, um, you just have to uh, keep going back to, to what the point of your game was at the beginning. Um, I watched a, a, a really good talk uh, a, a few months ago from one of the designers of, um, of uh, uh, Into the Breach, Justin Ma, uh, and he talked about um, how all the way through uh, that game's really long development, they just kept going back to their um, sort of original idea, which was to make a game um, about collateral damage. And even though the game they started originally making was really different to the, the game they ended up with, um, that principle of exploring the idea of collateral damage in a game really stuck all the way through. Uh, and you just have to keep reminding yourself again and again what that guiding principle was. It's hard work. Um, Next question, uh, James. Any thoughts on auto chess on the auto chess genre and how our asymmetry plays into them, and how is it different from the MOBA genre? Uh, genre is inspired by. Uh, so yes, I have played auto chess quite a lot, and there's obviously a million different auto chess games out uh, at the moment. Um, uh, how asymmetry plays into them? Uh, well, au the auto chess games are drafting games uh, essentially. Um, I don't know if they're heavily asymmetrical games in, in terms of the the player asymmetry I, I talked about. Um, the examples I gave, you know, games like, like StarCraft, like Street Fighter, um, you're choosing a character or a faction at the beginning and no matter what you do throughout the game, your choice of, uh, your choice at the start really matters uh, and that's not going to change. Um, if you pick Terran in StarCraft, you're not going to be able to make Zerg units by the end of the game, you're still going to be Terran, just despite how, how far you go down the, the tech tree. And that sort of inherent asymmetry um, uh, is, is really is really key. Uh, uh, and that was obviously something I was focusing on in, in, in the talk. Auto chess is different. Auto chess, you start with a, a blank canvas. You can you can draft in, in any direction you want. And obviously the asymmetry comes from uh, how your deck uh, uh, or your sort of uh, roster of, of team members ends up being different to the the players you you're up against rather than than how you started so it's it is asymmetry uh, you do you start off symmetrical you end up in an asymmetric place uh, but it's a different kind of of asymmetry and as i said at the beginning there's there's tons of, of types of of asymmetry there's probably 400 hours of of talks uh, in different aspects of, of asymmetry in game design um, uh, and the second part of your question was how is it different from the the MOBA genre it was inspired by well it's it's I mean, it's a completely different game. Um, all it really uses from MOBAs is is the sort of playing pieces as, as a sort of visual, um, a sort of visual justification. Uh, obviously, it keeps. I mean, it keeps things like items and, and things like that. Uh, but in other ways, it's it's similar. It's it's not similar at all, really. Uh, even the drafting 
the word drafting in MOBAs describes something completely different to the sort of ongoing draft that, that characterizes auto chess. Uh, what do you think the uh, inherent value, what do you think is the inherent value of asymmetry? Why do players enjoy it? Um, uh, people enjoy asymmetry, I think, because it's it's agency. It's uh, it's you making uh, quite an impactful decision, sometimes early in the game, sometimes throughout the course of the game. Um, it's also self-expression, right? Uh, when you see a roster of, of, I don't know, character classes in, in Overwatch, you can imprint yourself on, on the, the different characters. Um, Sometimes through identity, you might choose to play a character that, that looks like you or you feel has your, your personality. Sometimes it's mechanical. You like to play in a certain way and, and there's a character that sort of fits fits that mold. Um, uh, uh, psychographics is, is sometimes the, the word that's used to describe that. Um, but, but that's why they enjoy it. It's that sort of self-expression um, and that agency. Uh, next question. How do you balance for asymmetry in competitive modes or for example in blitz for halo wars 2 um how do you balance uh, for something like halo wars 2 well um the answer is that um there isn't a magic wand for for balance uh, i mean the best way to achieve balance in a, in a game is is having time on your side um uh, both you know before you release the game you, you play as much as possible and obviously if if you're lucky you'll have a long development cycle in which you can play the game a lot and you can balance that way um having long beaters having lots of beaters um if you don't have that uh then you know just supporting your game for a long period of time um you know time is the biggest ally with with balance um uh, i mean you know particularly with the example of, of Halo Wars 2. I mean, we supported the game for, you know, nearly a year. Um, uh, and and Proof of Three Industries uh, are still releasing patches to this day, sort of two years on, and, and they show no sign of not doing that. Um, on the Total War side, I mean, we're still patching and adding stuff to, to Rome 2, which I think is nearly five years old even now so uh the reality is with with balance there are lots of good techniques and things but but time is is your biggest ally um and then the the last question i i think is uh how does asymmetry factor into live games that are consistently updated um i sort of i guess i answered that a little bit um so for live games, well, it I mean, it depends what exactly you're doing for your, your live game. I assume by constantly up, updated, you mean you're adding content, right? You're, um, you're adding new characters or, or content later in the game. Um, how does asymmetry factor into it? Well, um, the biggest thing is that uh, the more you make a game, the longer you work on it, uh, the better you get at, at making it and the better you get at understanding... Um, asymmetry in your in your games um in your game um i mean when we were doing halo wars 2 i mean we ended up making 16 leaders for, for that game and the ones we did at the end were um you know we did them a lot faster and we were exploring much crazier ideas and executing them much better than we did at the the beginning and that's just that's just reality right you you get better and better at something um uh, talking to the the warhammer guys they stay the same like they're uh they're so you know the, some of the the lords they've done more recently for for warhammer are just like so interesting and so crazy compared to the ones they they did at the beginning and and that's why they've sort of started to go back and and um fix some of those those early lords and characters and uh and actually increase the amount of um asymmetry uh in them uh, and they're doing some really interesting stuff there and, and adding mechanics back into to old lords um so yeah, that's that's it. That's that's all the the questions I've I've got. I I believe. Um, so thank you very much for watching this BAFTA Games live stream, um, and watch this space for for future tutorials. Thank you very much.